Hey everyone, I'm Steve from GamersNexus.net and we're doing another Ask GN episode. I think we're on episode 6 now. And we have some pretty good questions this week that I'm excited to dive into. And all of those are technical related except for one. The one that is not is about the recent Star Citizen drama, for lack of a more concise term. So, through Reddit and elsewhere I've received the question, are you planning on covering the current happenings with Star Citizen? And that's specifically relating to the escapists' allegations, you could say, against the Star Citizen team, the Cloud Imperium Games team. So, just to get this out of the way, right away at the top of the show here, no, we will not be covering it immediately. There is a chance we will cover it in the future, but not at this time. And the reason for that is because when I started this site in 2008, it was my objective to really dive deep talking about content and how hardware works, how it interacts with games, how games are made, how they utilize that hardware. And occasionally we'll just talk about games, not relating to hardware at all. But the point is all of the content, at least for the most part, especially recently, tries to go deep and talk about things with which we have hands-on experience or verifiable, validated evidence, things that we can talk to experts on. And in the case of the current events with a certain media outlet and the Cloud Imperium Games team, we just, I don't feel like we have enough data to report on, and I feel like all it does is add fuel to the fire without necessarily adding meaningful commentary. So if, if I don't feel like what I'm saying has any weight or usefulness in the current environment, the current atmosphere of the games and hardware industries, it's really not worth diving into from, from my perspective. So uh, hopefully that makes sense. We will not be covering it at this time. As details emerge that could change the current standing of the claims from from the escapist side, from Cloud Imperium Games side, are very serious. They have very serious implications for the game itself, obviously. They have serious implications for the game industry, for journalists in the industry, how this type of thing is handled in the future. So it's, it's not something that's uh, an item to make light of. It's not a movie to watch. It's very serious, and we want to treat it with respect in that regard, so I'm staying away from it for now. So that stated, let's get into the fun hardware questions that I am pretty, uh, pretty excited to talk about here. The first one is fairly straightforward. Human Livestock asks, my question is, what is holding GPUs back with 4K gaming? Is it weak GPU cores? Seems like memory bandwidth doesn't help much. So starting with the end of that question first, memory bandwidth doesn't help much is an interesting statement because you can point at the new video cards using HBM, the Fury X, for example, and see that its tremendous bandwidth doesn't necessarily forward 4K gaming playability on that card with any really game-changing level of, of frame rate disparity. So the Fury X, for example, is a pretty, it's got pretty good architecture. It's very well designed. It's got HBM. Doesn't necessarily make it a great performer. That's something we talked about in the Fury X review. But in terms of architecture, massive shade array, all that stuff, and it still feels like it's kind of stuck in some games when it comes to 4K gaming. And that's in spite of having a huge memory bandwidth and very fast memory and new types of memory. So to answer the question, it is the cores, the frequency of those cores, how efficient they handle certain operations. So ultimately, yes, uh, it is the GPU itself holding, holding 4K back more than the memory bandwidth necessarily. So uh, hopefully that addresses that. This you can kind of see in part by throwing more GPUs into a system where you don't get more memory, you don't get more memory bandwidth and you, you see a, an increase in 4K or 1440p performance, and that is largely because of the way the cores are handled and because of the extra processing power you get in such a configuration. So we are still held, held back on 4K gaming for now. It's becoming more possible. You look at the 980 Ti, you look at the Fury X, they can both play games at 4K. It just kind of depends on what game you want to play and how high the settings go. The Witcher 3, for instance, is very demanding and not too kind to really any single GPU solution at 4K. So that should address that decently. Uh, Alex Maya coming back here for another question. I think I addressed one of yours previously. 
And Alex says, hi, Steve, does RAM you get matter at all for gaming? For example, 1600 megahertz versus 2400 megahertz, eight gigabytes versus 16 gigabytes, cast latency is nine versus 10, or should I just choose the one that has the prettiest colors? So uh, this, I reported on this a couple of times now. The, the back part of the question, the prettiest color part, I talked about this a few years ago after I talked to David Leon from Kingston at one of the PAX events, and we talked about how RAM is a commodity now. So yeah, the color actually does kind of matter because it's become so sort of stale, the development of the memory industry, that color and appearance are starting to become relevant because the specs are really all very similar or the same or close enough that it doesn't matter on paper. So yeah, that is actually kind of important, and it, it seems silly to say that, but aesthetically, you should buy a kit of memory that you like. Now, you should also buy one that's backed by a manufacturer you can trust and has decent reviews and a low return rate, but generally, the, the better-looking kits do coincide with the reasonably performing kits. So in terms of the frequency, there are a couple of parts to this question. The frequency, if you're using an APU or an IGP, like the Intel ones, then yes, frequency matters, density matters, capacity not quite as much, but it does matter. And that's because the IGPs and the APUs do not have their own on-card memory. So when you buy a discrete GPU or a dedicated GPU, a DGPU we'll call it, that has dies of memory on the card itself. And these use GDDR5, which is very fast transactional memory. It's a lot faster than system memory, DDR3 or even DDR4. And it's also physically closer to the GPU. So the GPU doesn't have to communicate through the bus, through the chipset or the CPU, through, and then to the memory and then back again. It's, it's talking almost directly to the memory on the card and the CPU does get involved as it always does, draw calls, it gets directly involved there. But it's proximity-wise very close to the card, so it's a lot faster. It's also just faster memory. So in that case, when you use a dedicated card, you're going to have way faster and way better memory performance than when you're using an APU or an IGP, which has to access system memory. And to that extent, frequency does matter quite a lot, actually. And uh, we've seen performance differences of 10%-ish in sort of the middle to high end with APUs and IGPs using 1600 megahertz versus 1866 or 20, 2133. So it does matter there. For someone using a DGPU, the answer is no, not really. You, you kind of see a little difference at the low end, like 1333, which isn't really made anymore, versus 1600. Uh, once you get past that, the differences get a lot smaller and they're smaller to the point that the money spent getting the next bump up in memory kit would probably better be spent on something like a better video card because the difference between a memory increase in speed and a GPU increase or an SSD added to the system is it's a big gap there. Talking about uh, density or capacity, you ask about eight gigabytes versus 16 gigabytes. So there's something in memory we call density. That is how big the die, the memory dies are on the actual PCB. So those come in different capacities. You see eight gigabyte sticks, you see four gigabyte sticks, two gigabyte sticks. That's what we call density. A higher density stick, if you buy two eight gigabyte ones versus four four gigabyte ones, you have 16 in either scenario. In theory, a higher density stick should be slightly higher performing. For gamers, really you're not gonna see that difference ever. I, I mean, it like, never. <laughs> so I would not worry about it there. If you're in a really serious production environment and you're building maybe a lot of workstations for a render farm or something, then it's time to worry about density, especially if you're trying to cram more memory capacity into one system because then you need higher density chips to actually be able to achieve 64 gigabytes or more or whatever you're trying to do. So the cast latencies do matter you do start sacrificing frequency or latency depending on which direction you're going so that is an argument that can be made for uh, for production workloads but for gaming again just get something sort of 1600 megahertz ish 1866 if you're feeling like spending a bit more if you have a dgpu and for the most part any cast latency 
with with those types of chips is going to do just fine on a gaming setup. So I would not worry too much about it there. I wouldn't just buy the prettiest one though. Definitely target like a 1600, maybe two by four kit for the best outcome. One by eight you can get. It's higher density, but you lose dual channel, but that actually has almost no impact on gaming. And, and we tested this. It has very little impact on anything really, except again, production. Check the channel, search it for dual channel, dual dash channel, and you'll see what I'm talking about there. But no, it doesn't matter too much these days. The last question here is, hi Steve, I have a question, <laughs> that's a good start. What is the difference between processor PCIe lanes and PCIe lanes in the chipset? Does adding a Wi-Fi PCIe card by four reduce my graphics card link with CPU down from 16 to by eight? So this is a pretty good question. We'll talk about Skylake first and then look at the Haswell unit that the Asker has. With Skylake, the Z170 chipset has 20 PCIe lanes on it. It's got 26 HSIO lanes, high-speed IO lanes, and 20 PCIe lanes included within that. The 20 PCIe lanes are in clusters of four. So there's five sets of four. Five by four is 20. And to that extent, you can't actually use them for an SLI setup because NVIDIA requires by eight. So you can't use those extra chipset lanes for SLI, but you can use it for things like M2 cards. If you have an SSD and you wanna get an M2 SS, M.2 SSD, you can use those lanes there because those are by four at best right now. If you get an NVMe PCI Express card, even though it's sitting in a PCIe slot on the motherboard, it will communicate through the chipset and use the chipset's four lanes made available to it. In the case of Wi-Fi cards, like this question, it will also communicate through the chipset because the chipset is handling all of that communication, all the I.O., and the CPU in this instance will allocate all of its lanes available, 16, to the GPU. Now, some CPUs have more than 16 lanes. They have 20 or 24. Just depends on which architecture you're looking at. So in this instance, no, adding a Wi-Fi card with a buy four requirement to your setup will not eat into your CPU lane av availability through the CPU itself, the PCIe lanes. It will go straight through the chipset. And in this case, the questioner is using an H81 chipset, which has a maximum of six PCIe lanes. So it will use some of those six, basically, and you'll still get by 16 on the GPU. That said, if any of you find yourself in a case where you're in a situation you lose some of the PCIe lanes to your graphics setup, say so you're going down to by eight from by 16, that's really not a big issue because the by eight versus by 16 performance, the delta is, is pretty small. It's basically immeasurable for most games and graphics cards, depends on the video card because faster ones will care more. But um, even at the very high end, it's a pretty small difference because PCIe 3 has a pretty high throughput and it's large enough that the interface is not the bottleneck here. It's the video card itself is slower than the interface. So you can really not spend a lot of effort being concerned about by versus by 16. Obviously everyone wants by 16 if you're doing a single GPU setup, just if it's a little bit better, it feels better too, because otherwise it's just, it doesn't feel quite right when you're buying it. But uh, that should answer that. So that's all for this week. If you have questions for the next video, post them in the comments below. I check this video first for the next one. So post them there. If you like this type of content, as always, hit that Patreon link in the post roll. We've picked up a lot of supporters in the last week or so. And for that, I'm greatly appreciative to all of you. And uh, I certainly hope that you'll provide feedback if you have different types of content you'd like us to explore. If you have people you want us to interview, please post them below. Tweet at us at GamersNexus. I will see that first. And we'll try and set those up and see what we can do to produce some good content that is based in observable facts and researchable things. So that's all for this time. I will see you all next time.